Drag Race fans, as any other fans do, love to say that a certain queen was poorly treated on the show just based on their own subjective opinions of the show. However, when I make these, I'm solely talking about the logistics of the show and legitimate things that certain queens had to endure for one reason or another over other queens. But how about a scenario where queens suffer based on the show wanting to set itself up as a show about drag artists that are solely men and that solely do drag to look like women, and as such be queer presenting but still familiar to the non-queer folk. This is a little ironic because neither the show nor the title that the winner gets suggests that the person in question has to be a drag queen, though over the years and just it being Rue's show, that was kind of what it said itself to be. And even now, a whole decade after the first season, we haven't had a single winner that deviates from the template or formula of a person with a penis looking like some sort of a woman in drag. You could say that the likes of Sharon Needle, Sasha Velour, and Evie Oddly don't fit into this idea, but all of them, most of the time, present themselves in drag again as some sort of a woman. This isn't a negative critique on them, nor even a positive one, it's just an observation. It is a little ironic that the first ever mainstream show for queer people, by queer people, started off heavily suffering from trying to please tradition and very non-queer views of masculinity and femininity, and to this day, certain bits and pieces of them are still present. But the queens that had to endure silly critiques that have no place in a, as I've already said, show by queer people for queer people are Nina Flowers and Ongina. During their stints on season 1, both Nina and Ongina got almost constant negative critiques on looking too masculine. Now, the ideas of masculinity and femininity are very subjective, they vary from culture to culture, from community to community, from person to person, so the fact that they are such variables should be a clear sign that they are not real, or at least not based in reality. Some people may disagree with this, but from my experience, those people feel some sort of a discomfort being painted as one or the other, so it's not their fault. I rewatched season 1's critiques on the runway for both Ongina and Nina, and other queens too, and we're gonna go through them now, episode by episode, just so that you can see how silly, and if I may interject here, how stupid and unfair they were, given how fierce both of these queens are. In episode 1, Ongina was given three comments, one by Merle, one by Bob Mackie, and one by Rue herself. Merle told her, and I quote, When I heard the name Ongina, I thought, oh my dear, this just sounds like a cross between a heart attack and a yeast infection, which I don't get. When I put it together with the look and the whole loofah kind of Carrie Bradshaw goes to Rio, it's very charming. Afterwards, Bob Mackey said, You know exactly how you want to look, and it's so obvious. You wear it like, this is mine. Which is neither a compliment nor an insult, it's along the lines of, you're doing you and that's great. RuPaul, the host of the show, most famous drag artist of all time, someone who should be a beacon of light for the community, but also someone who built a career on, you know, looking like a woman in drag, said, I was very impressed, although when I see you, I still see a little boy, I would love to see more of a little lady. What's even more interesting is that Merle critiqued Rebecca Glasscock right after Angina, saying that she read as a boy in girls clothes on the runway. So basically, androgyny, or whatever you want to call it, is fine if you do it well if you don't look busted, which is the main difference between Rue's critique and Merle's. There's not much when it comes to the critiques in episode 2, however, Rue has another very stupid thing to say. Merle critiques Nina for still going a little too punk god with her her style, given that the challenge was to be a one-unit girl group, much like Destiny's Child, so very minimal to almost no individuality, and that's a fair critique. It's a critique on Nina's performance in the challenge. But then, Rue goes, I have to give her props for becoming more feminine. She covered up her tats. Nina Flowers looked more feminine to RuPaul because she couldn't see her tattoos. Yes, tattoos. That thing that only shows up on men's skin once they reach a certain age that's completely natural and... Oh, wait. What's that? Tattoos are literally just cool paintings, writing, or artwork somebody chooses to have on their body. Oh... This isn't the first and the last time this would happen. For example, in season 10, many queens complimented a couple of Cameron Michaels runway looks when she would cover up her tattoos, but they would critique her saying that she looks too manly with them. I honestly can't remember if the judges ever said that, 
But the queen's, oh boy, do I remember. For the third episode, Angina is told by Merle that she looks better with no hair, because she wore a wig in the maxi challenge when the queen's had to pay homage to Oprah by doing like a news bulletin and then interview Tori Spelling and her husband. Angina was also complimented on her humor. Mind you, so far, neither Santino nor Merle ever said anything about either of the two looking too masculine or even masculine at all. But then something happened in episode 3. Bibi Zahara Benet, whom I forgot Ru called Bibi Benet on season 1, which doesn't have the same ring to it at all, won the main challenge and came out on the runway in her iconic catsuit leopard print giant hair look, which she would then go on to ruin the legacy of by redoing it the most chances she gets. She presented herself as both stunning and glamorous, but also eloquent and approachable in the maxi challenge. Bibi was a fierce queen, not from the US, so she was a queen that brought a certain high glamour note to the show, most of the time, while still reading as, as much as I hate to say it, exotic, mysterious even. She brought something no other girl in season 1 could, but she wasn't the only one who was unique in that sense. Keep what I just said in mind when we reach the end of the critiques. In the next episode, episode 4, the two guest judges gave Angina some interesting critiques. Firstly, Jenny Shimizu, or Shimizu, I don't know, one of the two, told her, and I quote, when you came walking down the runway, I had the same feeling when I saw Naomi Campbell walking on the runway, and it was like a savage beast. Imagine being compared to Naomi fucking Campbell by someone who only ever saw you once and for like a minute at that. The second guest judge, Gordon S. Pinay, Gordon S. Pinnitz, I don't know, said that Angina's makeup was a little too much, which, yeah, that's a fair critique. So, Angina is still in the clear. Nina, however, is told by Merle, and I quote, your arms give away the man, the chest gives away the man, and I'm not reading any woman at all. This is completely out of character for Merle, mind you, someone who had seen Nina three times already and never even remotely alluded to needing to see this out of her. I'm not trying to start conspiracies, but isn't that just like a little weird? You know, that she just suddenly switched her outlook on drag? Almost as if she might have been told that Nina isn't the type of a queen they'd want to win the season. Also, surprisingly enough, they decided to remove immunities the queens got prior right before episode 5 and Ongina won the maxi challenge in episode 4. Hmm. For Angina's final episode, episode 5, after she won two maxi challenges and placed high twice as well, the only negative critique she got was about the whole masculine-feminine thing. As in, she was told that she looked too masculine and was put into the bottom two for it, against BB. What's worse is that Rebecca Glasscock, who I must admit I was enamored with out of drag when I watched the first season for the first time, and honestly kind of still am, won this challenge, and that's just because she and her girl wore the same dress, the same hair, no, sorry, wig, that's a wig, and had pretty makeup on. Anyways, back to the lip sync. They both did great in the lip sync, I'll give them that. However, from the storyline point of view, from the competition point of view, from the I can see BB's weird way of lip syncing where she sometimes just makes her mouth open and close as if she were a puppet point of view, Angina should have won this. You had her be constantly one of the best queens on the show, or the best queen, she falls into the bottom two and lip syncs to stronger, wouldn't it make sense without two? to keep her. I guess not, cause she was eliminated. And this marked a drag race first, of Rue having to excuse herself and go talk to the producers to decide who should go home. To talk to the producers. That's all I'm gonna say. In the sixth episode, Nina Flowers was given praise on how feminine she looked, and the guest judge essentially said something that Rue and the producers were thinking when making their decisions past episode 3 and for the winner of the season. I think the one that for me that looks more like could do a job as amazing as you've done in your career is Bibi. Yeah. I began this video saying that a lot of the times fans will say a certain queen was mistreated because they personally like them, and in this scenario, yeah, I absolutely adore Door, Nina Flowers and Angina, and the fact that both of them lost directly to BB while objectively being better than her with how the season went definitely makes me dislike BB to an extent. However, it's really not her fault. She was just the right person in the right place at the right time. This video is a critique on Drag Race and its hypocrisy from the get-go. We absolutely can 
can say that they probably didn't know what they were doing and that they were picking who they wanted to stay or go on the fly and maybe we can forgive them for it because again it was the first season but still it gives off a really bad image that the center point of drag culture and to an extent queer culture is a show that started out as very misandristic when it came to its competitors presentations while selling us a very uniform view of queer identities that queer men must be feminine and that queer women must be either non-existent or feminine, I guess they weren't sure either. Season 1 had this unique system where the fans would vote each week who they think should go home in the upcoming episode, and the show would present that somewhere mid-critiques. As much as the fans, critics, and queens themselves love to say that the new audience of Drag Race has ruined the show, and how the fans gravitate more towards skinny white queens more often than an uh, random episode comes out, it's actually not so. A certain duo on YouTube that has made Drag Race analysis videos where they cater to the social justice warriors that think that white people are like lactose, basically good for nothing, praised how season 1 and 2 had a predominantly black and queer audience, and how the more diverse the audience got, the worse the show and the expectations for it got. Well, if that's the case, then I guess the audience really disliked the forms of drag that weren't about looking like a woman, which is either contradictory or absolutely incorrect, and somebody talking out of their ass to please a certain portion of their audience. When the cast was announced, and before the season had even aired, the three queens that got the most amount of votes as to go home first were Tammy Brown at 61%, Angina at 12%, and Nina Flowers at 7%. The only three queens that deviated from the whole dressed resembling a girl idea that people still to this day have about drag. As you may or may not remember, Tammy was safe in episode 1, on Gina High, while Nina Flowers won the main challenge. In the second episode, so after seeing the first episode, Akasha got 77% of the votes, which makes sense, she was in the bottom two, so the audience must have thought that she'd be a weak competitor and wanted her gone, while Tammy and Onjina still were here. Tammy at 15% and Onjina at 5%. Akasha is yet again first in the third episode, which makes sense. Here she got 75% of the votes. The second place was either Ongina or Chanel at 12%. I say this because the graphic used a picture of Ongina, but Chanel's name was written, while BB, surprisingly enough, was at 4% and in the third place. Episode 4 had this mistake yet again, though because of her bottom two placement in the episode prior, I'd assume that Chanel was first here, even though, as I've said again, they used a picture of Angina, and also Angina was at 10% and third place. Rebecca actually takes the top spot in the fifth episode with 49% of the votes, Chanel is second with 31% of the votes, and Nina Flowers at 8% in the third place. For the final episode where somebody was eliminated, episode 6, Rebecca was first again and again with 49% of the votes, Chanel was second at 27%, and Nina was third with 7%. Wait a second. Why is the fourth slice that should just be BB larger than the third? Why was BB, who apparently got 17% of the votes, not shown here as third? Is it because they were pushing for her to win and seeing that she was neither the best in the competition nor the favorite to win in the penultimate episode would damage the first ever winner? Is it because she resembled RuPaul the most out of all of the queens and her main competition were an overconfident showgirl, a Latina queen whose first language isn't English with a cool alternative style that to this day resonates with the audience, but also a bubbly, charming, adorable personality, or another alternative queen whose main selling point was that she was a bald queen? while at the same time she had an amazing personality, was funny as fuck, very likable, very approachable, and very cool. We may never get an actual answer for these questions surrounding BB, but then again, we never found out whose lipstick BB picked out on All Stars 3, so I guess we should all just be used to it by now.